that everybody that's uh, watching out there today is going to uh, have a great deal of uh, uh, knowledge com you know, conferred on them by the three ministers that we have here today. Really, uh, you know, the first part of our, um, of our uh, program is to introduce the ministers in, in, in many ways. I don't need to introduce any of them. Uh, they are well known to the people that are uh, watching today. Seamus O'Regan, uh, Federal Minister of Natural Resources, uh, the Member of Parliament, uh, for St. John's South Mount Pearl, uh, the home of the uh, what I observe to be the best fish and chip shop, Chesses, uh, in town. Uh, we can talk about that later. And of course, <laughs> uh, we've got Bronwyn Eyre, uh, Minister of, uh, of uh, I better get this straight here, Minister responsible for Sask Energy and Sask Water, Minister of uh, Energy and Natural Resources since February of 2018. Uh, a speaker of three languages. So, I mean, we could ask questions in French, German, or Italian in addition to English. And then finally, we've got uh, Minister Savage uh, from the province of Alberta, Minister of Energy, Deputy House Leader uh, since uh, April 30th of 2019, uh, and uh, really somebody who is uh, remarkably well-suited for her portfolio. In fact, I would say all three of you are. I mean, I've, I've tried to uh, look at the background of... Uh, uh, Minister O'Regan's master's thesis that he completed at, uh, at uh, Oxford. Remarkable uh, background that you bring, considering that your mandate letter really focuses uh, on uh, issues relating to Indigenous opportunities. Uh, Minister Savage has a master's degree uh, in law in energy and environment. Uh, again, perfectly suited for her current role. Bronwyn Eyre, um, uh, attended McGill University and the University of Saskatchewan graduating in law. Uh, so we've got a really remarkable panel of guests here today. Um, I'm going to, uh, we're going to do this in a fireside chat. I spoke with the ministers and, and um, let me say that I think it's terrific that we've got them. I thank all of you for uh, coming on today. And we agreed that we're going to do this in a fireside chat sort of way. I'm trying to bring out my inner Larry King. So that's why I've got suspenders on. Um, let's start with a relatively light subject. Uh, that's hydrogen. So um, the issue of hydrogen is something that uh, is in, of interest to both uh, provincial and the federal governments. Um, but I want to make this observation. Uh, you know, liquefied natural gas, LNG, is an opportunity in Canada that appears to have been bogged down. Uh, Japan is still waiting for its first deliveries. And our, our reputation as a reliable supplier has suffered. And so uh, we had an early start, but we haven't been able to capitalize uh, on LNG the same way that, say, uh, Australia has. So uh, my first question, and I throw this out to all three of our ministers, how can we make sure that hydrogen doesn't have the same outcome? What is it that we need to do to make sure that you know, we're in a, a good position to take advantage of what the world wants in terms of, uh, you know, a lower uh, carbon intensive form of energy. Maybe I'll start with Minister O'Regan, since the hydrogen strategy of the federal government was just released um, back in December of this uh, of uh, last year. Uh, thanks, Gary. I, I would say, you know, I think uh, very Canadian the way that we just set this up, right? Uh, I mean, in the, in the sense that we find the one country in the world that has done, I think, a very, very good job saying we're missing the mark. It is Australia, and I agree that they, they've done well, but we are doing well. Um, we are doing very well on LNG. I mean, the goal is to make Canada the cleanest LNG producer in the world. Um, you know, you got, you got clean power from BC's electrical grid. Um, LNG Canada, I think, uses, uh, you know, 15% uh, of that for its needs. You got high efficiency gas turbines at the liquefaction plant. You know, these make it the lowest emissions intensity LNG facility in the world once it begins exporting. Uh, it was the biggest private sector investment uh, in Canadian history. So, you know, we're working with BC to expand its renewable electricity grid uh, to power uh, to LNG facilities in uh, Kitimat, in Haisla Nations, uh, Cedar LNG, and wood fiber. Um, and Fortis is developing infrastructure at Tilbury LNG to supply clean LNG to fuel ships that are operating in, in, the, in the port of Vancouver. Um, there, there is a huge, huge export uh, capacity for LNG. And as for hydrogen, 
Um, it was uh, Mayor Nachu uh, when we announced the hydrogen strategy, uh, Gary, that you were speaking of. Um, when, when she was asked, I think I was asked the direct, I was asked the direct question, can we do this? And uh, Mayor Nachu said, we know we can do this because we're doing it, uh, which is the best quote. Uh, the proton energy outside of Calgary is already finding ways to, to produce hydrogen from old uh, oil and gas wells. And, and our strategy is, the big thing for, for the hydrogen strategy and national strategy was taking into account regional strengths like I do. I mean, I'm, you know, I'm here in Newfoundland. Um, I think there's a frustration in many parts of the country that aren't in the central part of the country that, you know, you're often forgotten or, you know, you have a kind of one size fits all uh, national strategy. We have, uh, you know, we've got all sorts of potential um, for hydrogen in Quebec and potentially, I would argue, in Newfoundland and Labrador. Um, again, very different from one another, also different from Saskatchewan and, and from Alberta. And, uh, and any national strategy should take all of those um, those, those strengths and those challenges into account. But we see, you know, I, I won't, I know most of, most people are familiar with hydrogen. Um, just to say that even though I can remember being on the bus in, in, at Expo 86 in Vancouver, giving away my age on a hydrogen bus, pretty sure it was a Ballard power bus out of the lower mainland. And, and also they had a fleet of them at the 2010 Olympics in, in Vancouver and in Whistler. Now I think hydrogen is, it, it People are serious about it. There's a lot of jurisdictions that are putting a lot of money into it. And these are potential customers. They are also competitors, the European Union, South Korea, uh, Japan. Um, the US is gonna come on big on this. And whenever the US does something, it's always big. So we gotta get ready. Uh, I'll, I'll just end with this to say, not only do we have the natural resources, we have the people. We have the people with the expertise and the ability to do this in Canada. So I'm going to get back to you, Minister O'Regan, about the opportunity in the United States, but I want to give uh, Bronwyn Air an opportunity to, uh, to wade in on this as well. Well, thanks, Gary. I mean, Saskatchewan does have a first of its kind um, hydrogen pilot project that, that's now underway. And if it's, if it's successful and scalable, um, you know, it could be a game changer because its production method is, is low cost. Um, and it produces very low um, GHG emissions. I, I guess in terms of just the export challenges, I mean, we all know that, you know, LNG, for example, you know, some countries around the world, of course, just don't have those gas reserves. Um, the issue with hydrogen, of course, is that, you know, if you, if you have water and you have electricity um, and you decide to domestically invest in hydrogen, um, you can do it. So, Around, uh, uh, the, the exporting of it is always, you know, comes with some challenges. And I think, you know, just as we, as we look at this, we have to kind of make sure that we, we, we go in with our eyes open about the cost, for example. I mean, as again, everyone will know about 98% of all hydrogen produced in the world is high carbon intensity um, production. And that's at industrial sites. And, and so oil refineries and fertilizer plants that consume it on site. If you go to a low carbon um, intensity hydrogen economy, which is what the, the federal government has stated that it will do, that will require you know, hundreds of, of billions of dollars of investment. So again, uh, you know, eyes wide open in terms of the costs, eyes wide open in terms of um, the exporting challenges around that versus something such as LNG. Um, I think we, you know, we, there's a lot of buzz about hydrogen at the moment. We all know why. And um, we just have to, to be realistic about what that means for, for governments and, and subsidies and so on. That's fair. Yeah. Thanks, Minister Ayer. Uh, Minister Savage, I, I, you know, the province of Alberta has a natural gas strategy. Hydrogen is part of that. Maybe you'd like to talk about that for a sec. Sure. Well, I guess uh, I see a, a very, very optimistic future for hydrogen. And I guess the starting starting point in this is that we are we are working closely with the federal government on this and uh, appreciate uh, the support from the federal government because the world will be looking for hydrogen. It is it might be it might be many years out, but we know that there's going to be a demand for it as the world moves towards uh, uh, lower emitting sources of energy. So I think that's the starting point, point is continued cooperation with the federal government on this and making sure that uh, that uh, blue hydrogen uh, sourced from natural gas is, is top of the list and it doesn't get into a conversation with, uh, with uh, 
uh, others that, that only green hydrogen will be pursued. We're not gonna get to green hydrogen without having a very robust uh, development of blue hydrogen, blue hydrogen being made from natural gas, coupled with uh, carbon capture utilization and storage. So I guess uh, that leads us to CCUS, carbon capture utilization and storage. And that's another area that we're working with the federal government on because we see this um, as being very, very key to Alberta's energy future. We have the feedstock here. We have an abundant supply of natural gas. It's, it's uh, um, cost competitive. We have the expertise here in the natural gas industry. We have infrastructure in place. So we need uh, we, to pursue it. We're going to have to, uh, to go big and we're gonna need to do it uh, with, with the federal government. So let's conclude that by saying uh, green hydrogen versus blue hydrogen is a bit of red herring. So I wanna go back to uh, Minister O'Regan. Uh, and, and when he talked about um, sort of uh, the issue of uh, moving forward, uh, particularly with respect to the United States, uh, I understand that uh, Australia uh, has gone into an MOU with Germany where Germany has um, agreed uh, that they will buy hydrogen from Australia when hydrogen plants are up and running. It kind of solves the chicken and egg problem because you know nobody's going to produce hydrogen unless you've got a customer, uh, and nobody's going to be a customer until you can produce hydrogen. So let me throw out this as a scenario, and this is a question from one of our viewers today. Could this be a solution for Keystone XL? Could you, could you enter into an MOU with the United States and say, you know, uh, you want to buy hydrogen at some point in the future as you transition. That's part of the Canadian strategy. It's part of the American strategy. Let's agree that you'll need infrastructure for it at some point. And so let's approve Keystone XL, um, put, put oil in it at first, but as we are able to transition to hydrogen, uh, that would be a way of having the infrastructure ready on day one, once that hydrogen is, uh, is, is being produced. Does that make any sense to you at all, Minister? First of all, I would say um, it's a private sector project. I mean, let's not forget it. I mean, you know, uh, federal government owns TMX. Uh, we don't own KXL. Um, and the market will make these decisions. I mean, TC Energy, you know, just to, uh, I was saying this yesterday, or last night we had an emergency debate in the House of Commons, Gary, on, on KXL, and I commended. TC Energy uh, on all the work that they've done. And I, I should let people who are watching know too, um, you know, we, we identified very early, uh, Sonia and I, and also Bromley and I, that this would, you know, this would be an issue and that it would be an uphill battle. And, and many people who, uh, whose advice we rely upon said to us, you know, what are you, what can you do to uh, get candidate Joe Biden to drop a major campaign commitment? Uh, we knew that was a challenge ahead of us. We knew it was a big one. Uh, we, we worked hand in glove with one another, our two governments uh, on the ground in Washington. Uh, you know, your old friend, James Rashad, uh, who's now the special representative position, I think, Gary, you once held uh, in Washington. You know how, you know how hard that job is. You know that the pressure that James was under. He worked hand in glove with Ambassador Hillman, Sonia and I. We were talking once a week uh, through uh, most of, uh, of the fall there and uh, in, in the winter and up until now. Um, so, you know, we did everything that we could. Uh, ultimately, this was very, you know, it was a keystone for the, those within the Democratic Party. And I think in the United States have become a political lightning, just the name of it. And uh, I think, you know, one of the things that Premier Kenny said about, you know, he said Alberta uh, said, he, he was calling, he said the Alberta government's calling on the federal government to talk in the broader context of an agreement on energy supply and climate action. And that is a conversation in which we ha should have KXL or, you know, our trade, you know, back and forth. And I, I agree with that wholeheartedly. Uh, I think that we have got uh, an opportunity. Um, let me be frank, we've dealt four years with the most unpredictable president that I could think of, to put it mildly. You know, we, we all got used, and I'm, I'm looking at my colleagues here, we all got used to, um, our energy policy uh, hanging on a tweet. Uh, and that's not the case anymore. Now we're, I think, back to kind of diplomatic, predictable government, I'm hoping. There's enough change going on. 
that uh, to have a somewhat normal relationship with the United States in which, you know, diplomacy takes hold and people are at the table and you can talk things through is going to be a refreshing change. I'll be blunt about that and still somewhat restrained. Um, so I'm looking forward to having those conversations about hydrogen and I'm looking forward to having those conversations in that broader context of energy security and, and continued prosperity between our two countries. They are going to need our product in all its forms and our energy for quite some time. Um, and now, you know, I think, you know, I think we've got an opportunity to align ourselves to make sure that, you know, I'm thinking of those people and, uh, you know, who are, who are laid off um, or, or we don't have work as a result of this decision. Uh, I, we need to make sure that they have work. And I think there's a potential for a lot of work, actually, between, between our two countries. You know, I think this is a topic that we're going to come back to towards the end of our time together. Uh, so I, I don't want to uh, occupy all of our time uh, with U.S.-Canada relations. Let's go on to um, something that uh, Minister O'Regan released, uh, and that's an action plan back in uh, December on small modular reactors. Uh, I've just got the, uh, the roadmap to the action plan in front of me. Uh, and uh, it, it, this is an area where Canada has a lot of expertise. And in your statement, uh, Minister O'Regan, you talked about how a quarter of our uh, Nobel Prize winners in Canada uh, deal with uh, uh, the issue of uh, uh, nuclear science. Um, so you've put out your SMR action plan. Uh, it brings together uh, 109 partners, including the provinces of Saskatchewan and Alberta, with 450 actions that are being tracked. Now, um, this is not a sure bet because MSR, uh, SMRs haven't been successfully commercialized anywhere yet, but it's certainly uh, a strong signal from the federal government that this is uh, important and coming up strongly. So uh, let, let's ask, first of all, uh, what do you see as the domestic opportunity here in Canada? And is there an opportunity to um, uh, create uh, a dominance in the international market for this type of technology. We'll start off with uh, Minister O'Regan. We have a huge competitive advantage in nuclear, and we would be foolish not we'd be foolish to squander it uh, on three fronts. We got the technology. Candy has stood the test of time. Uh, we have the people who are very good at this, best in the world. You know, we're tier one, and we're a tier one nuclear nation. Um, and thirdly, and it's not something that normally governments boast about, but we got a, we've got a competitive regulatory regime. We've got the best in the world, and people trust us on, on, on nuclear. So small modular reactors, the models that we are looking at, and, you know, it's, it's an investment in, for the federal government in the millions right now, but, you know, we'll see where it goes. Um, you know, what, what we're looking at uh, are, are small reactors that could be used um, to provide baseload electricity uh, in areas where we are utilizing renewables. We could use it in brownfield sites, we could use it in industrial sites, and potentially we could use it in the north and in, and in other areas where it's, 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 you know, it's expensive to get the grid up there. Um, it could benefit indigenous communities and everything. But I think, you know, we would look at, not, we're not experimenting up in the north. I mean, we, you know, we're looking at brownfield sites for that sort of thing. Um, but it's, it, the potential and the models that we're looking at not only minimize nuclear waste, but in, in some of the models we're looking at, recycle nuclear waste. Um, this is a, a, you know, this is a technology and has a fed expertise that we could easily export. And, and Gary, I'll, I'll throw it to my provincial colleagues, but just to say that uh, amongst provinces across the country, there has been a, a great deal of enthusiasm for this. Um, because, because people are looking at nuclear differently now in a low emissions world, nuclear is zero emissions. Zero. So when I was uh, in Washington, I remember Premier, former Premier Brad Wall was uh, in Washington talking about the type of uh, uranium resources that are in Saskatchewan, um, you know, the high quality of them. Um, and and I've, I know I've heard uh, your Premier today, uh, Premier Mo, talk about that, Minister Eric. Uh, give, us, give us your thoughts on this and the cooperation, the opportunity. Well, there are very hopeful opportunities around this, of course, very good opportunities. I mean, SMRs don't have the, the same infrastructure, um, grid management, as we know, the environmental financial risks that, that large scale nuclear plants do. I mean, a, a couple of cautionary points, um, I guess, just the expense. Um, again, the, the fact that, that, that 
you know, with respect, the, you know, the federal government, and it's very much appreciated, of course, the, the, all the goodwill around SMRs, and, and yes, absolutely what that can mean for Saskatchewan. Um, but again, comes with a, you know, a price tag. And so MOUs or non MOUs without funding from the, from the federal government or funding commitments around this, you know, puts provinces in a potentially, you know, somewhat tricky position that way, just on the expense front. The other thing, and I've, I've spoken to nuclear stakeholders here in Saskatchewan, and, you know, is of course around enrichment and that factor of SMRs. And I think that is going to cause some challenges, create certain challenges around, around education, around um, communication to people about what that means and, and the ramifications of that on the SMR model. The other thing is obviously, and you referenced this Gary, the, the scale, the fact these are, they, these are pilot projects um, on, different, on a different scale than have been tried or, or tried out previously. Where SMR technology has been used, I think we have to be very careful that we look at the cautionary tales. I mean, we know, for example, that in the States, um, you know, one state threw, you know, put a lot of money into SMRs and walked away, and another continues to put a lot of money into SMRs and it continues to be a lot of money. So again, just what lessons were learned from jurisdictions that have done this? Again, very realistic uh, view of the cost. Um, because transition, as we know, is transition, but it doesn't come without cost. So I, I think just important things for us to keep in mind, you know, as we go forward on this. Mr. Savage. Sure. Well, I guess uh, um, Alberta signaled our intention to join the um, memorandum of understanding with uh, Saskatchewan, Ontario, and New Brunswick on SMR development. And the, the difference in Alberta is that we have a energy only electricity market meaning that it's uh, the, the electricity is generate private sector generation. So this would be something for the private sector to, to pursue and it would be for the government to make the, the right conditions for, uh, for, for investment. And we, we do see a, a good future for SMRs in, in Alberta and particularly up in the oil sands, uh, remote uh, power generation, emission-free power generation. And uh, there, there really isn't a viable path to getting to net zero in around the globe without looking at nuclear. And so I think we have to find a way to, to, to uh, um, bring it into our energy mix in a way that's safe. And I think the oil sands is a very, very good place to start. And I know there's some, some definite interest there. So I, I, uh, I, I see some advantages for Alberta in that. And plus uh, like Saskatchewan, we have uh, uh, uranium we have rich uh, potential for uh, uranium right here in the province. So looking forward to those opportunities. We're going uh, to uh, switch over to a subject that I know is important to all three of these governments. Uh, uh, and um, yeah, that's in indigenous energy uh, projects and partnerships. So I'm gonna pull out uh, a couple of thoughts on this. Uh, I mean, we are seeing Indigenous communities playing a leading role in the energy sector through partnerships, equity positions, and project development. So here's the examples I want to cite. Uh, in, uh, in Saskatchewan, the First Nations Power Authority signed an agreement with Sask Power to secure $85 million worth of First Nations solar-led projects over the next 20 years. Uh, in Alberta, uh, the Cascade Power Project is a 900-megawatt natural gas plant uh, located near Edson and was uh, partially financed by uh, $93 million in the Indigenous Community Syndicate, uh, backstop by the Alberta government's Indigenous Opportunities uh, Corporation. Um, and, and, and there are other examples. Here's, here's one for Saskatchewan and Alberta. Natural Law Energy, a coalition of five Indigenous groups uh, announced an equity investment uh, you know, in the Keystone XL project. Uh, I imagine that that uh, coalition could be brought to bear on other energy projects should KXL not uh, go forward. So, um, so let, let me ask this question. Indigenous uh, equity participation in energy is likely something that all of your agreements agree is a good thing. And uh, is there an opportunity for your governments to work together? Uh, what does that mean in particular for how we tell our story abroad, especially to uh, capital markets. Uh, we'll start off with uh, we'll start off with uh, uh, Minister Savage. 
Sure, and I guess uh, the starting place for us is we, we've uh, set up the Alberta Indigenous Opportunities Corporation backstop with a billion dollars to help uh, Indigenous people pursue uh, equity and, and investment in energy projects because it was there's interest there. They, they want to be able to share in the prosperity. They want to be able to own some of these energy projects or, or have equity, but they just don't have access to capital the way the private sector does. They need, they need help. So that's exactly what we're doing with the uh, AIOC. Um, and you're right, the Cascade, uh, the Cascade uh, Power Project, was uh, their investment in there was enabled from the AIOC fund. So we're, uh, we're, we're uh, continue to work with them. And it is interesting from, and I, I know Minister <coughs> Reagan probably uh, confirmed this, but when we were discussing uh, with uh, counterparts in the United States about uh, what's different about KXL pipeline, what's different in 2020 uh, about KXL than in 2015. And I mean, there's uh, an endless list of why it's, uh, why it's a better pipeline, but there was also the, uh, the ownership from natural, natural law um, that, uh, that caught a lot of interest in the United States. We're doing things in Canada that are far, far ahead of anything they're doing in the United States on uh, anything ESG related, whether it's climate, whether it's including Indigenous people, we are miles ahead of the United States. And we're going to need to, to, to continue to do that to, to uh, ensure, ensure that we, we have a smooth uh, uh, energy, uh, energy relationship going forward. So I see, uh, I, I see that we need to do more work with Indigenous people. And just one more thing I'd like to reference is the uh, site rehabilitation program. That's the, uh, the fund uh, from, uh, to clean up uh, inactive wells, oil and gas wells. Uh, back from, uh, in Alberta, it's a billion dollars funded from the, uh, the federal government. We've been working really closely with uh, First Nation partnerships and we'll be rolling out a separate uh, program for the uh, separate uh, uh, um, tranche of, of, of funds for Indigenous people to be able to, uh, to make sure that they're getting sites on the, on the Indigenous lands cleaned up and that they are able to, to have jobs um, uh, and be able to be employed in it. So I think it's so important to, uh, to include them in all of these things. I do want to give uh, <clears throat> uh, Minister O'Regan some, uh, some credit, well-deserved credit for uh, the oil field services companies that are relying upon that billion dollar uh, fund for uh, cleanup of, uh, of uh, decommissioned wells. But before, uh, before we get to Minister O'Regan, I want to ask uh, Minister Ayer uh, this, uh, uh, this same question about uh, Indigenous equity participation and uh, you know, how, this, how this is working in Saskatchewan. Right. Well, I mean, last year, uh, Minister Savage and I participated, it was in Calgary in the, um, the National Coalition of Chiefs. Um, and the topic was defeat, you know, to the world, to your first question, you know, to the world and, and within Canada, as, that says it all. Um, you know, there, there must have been over a thousand people in that in room. At least the days before COVID, um, who were who were pro energy as Indigenous uh, voices, and they, you know, so the support is there. And and I I have spoken to to Minister O'Regan, and I certainly very much appreciate you know featuring those voices we talked about just the other day at the ministers' conference this summer in Sask in Saskatoon. Um, the, you know the the pro energy voices, um, because as I say it, in that forum. You know, there was talk about Enbridge Line 3, for example, and the replacement project and the thousands of communities that Enbridge, you know, consulted with, including many, many, many First Nations communities to get that project um, approved, um, bought into, supported. And I think, you know, there are two factors at play that we have to be very careful about. And, and again, Minister O'Regan and I were ch chatting about this the other day. One is condescension. I mean, in terms of getting the, the, the message out there about emissions participation. We, we have to perhaps stop characterizing uh, all Indigenous voices as feeling the same way about energy projects. And we saw that, you know, with, with Northern Gateway, for example, I and mean, how much support there was um, along that, that route. And even with Keystone last week and the announcement around Keystone, I mean, I didn't see a great deal of play 
when it came to the impact on on First Nations who were very disappointed about that decision. You know, I heard about, you know, the squad and I heard about, um, you know, from people who said that we sort of have to accept this now and move back. And all sorts of things, these projects, and it has a real impact on First Nations communities too. So you know, absolutely to, to Minister Savage's point, we have so much to, to promote, so much we're doing. We just have to, we have to do it more vocally. So Minister O'Regan, uh... Here's something that comes right out of your mandate letter from the Prime Minister. Uh, quote, there remains no more important relationship to me and to Canada than the one with Indigenous peoples. With respect and dignity, we remain committed to moving forward along the shared path of reconciliation. Tell me what that means to you in terms of, uh, in terms of energy. Uh, I grew up uh, in a little place in Labrador. And when I was there, uh, it was a fly and fly out community for most of the year, more or less. Um, and when I was 13 and I moved there, the first people that my father introduced me to were the, the Labrador Inu, uh, the leadership there. And he had gotten to know them. And uh, I had never met Indigenous people before. So you remember that when you're 12, 13 years old. Um, and then smartly the next week, he took me to their community, neighboring our community. And I saw how they looked and I saw how I looked. Uh, that makes a mark, it makes a big mark. So that's what, that's what I studied in university. And in, in fact, that's what I you know, did my master's on in was indigenous participation in natural resource development. Cause I saw economic development as the way forward for many nations. Now I can also tell you, I have stood at the assembly of first nations gathering of chiefs and uh, it makes the United Nations look like the Vienna boys choir in terms of harmony. Uh, they are, they are, they are, constantly disagreeing very vehemently amongst each other. I mean, it's, it's the United Nations is nothing. It, because, you know, and I find this very frustrating, the Bromlin's point, you know, when, 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 uh, when the president uh, revoked KXL's license, you know, it would just be said in the media and it was opposed by environmentalists and indigenous groups. That is not true. It was opposed by some. Uh, and it was not opposed by others. Others were looking at equity positions. And, and we're proponents of the project. I just, I've always resented the sweeping generalization of indigenous voices. It is, it is not accurate. Uh, and, and it's time, it, 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 it stifles those voices. You know, there are communities that have come to the conclusion that they want to be involved in, in economic development and in energy development. And they, you know, they have gone, this isn't something that, you know, this is something that they have thought about and really talked to their, at their kitchen tables about and in their community and made a decision only to have it thrown by the wayside. You're indigenous and we know how you think. Really? I, I just, I, I find it uh, preposterous. You have to listen to people. Reagan, and as a minister of indigenous services, I, and I was on the ground, I mean, you know, visiting communities, some are not for development. Some are for development if it happens on their terms and in their way and on their, on their schedule, you know, in their own time and done in their own way. And others are just, you know, boundlessly enthusiastic and, you know, uh, Sonia's government, which you're talking about, I mean, they're, they're not just, they're not, you know, not just in, involving participation, Brahmins do, but in building that capacity so that they can be fulsome partners, because that's a big problem for a lot of them, is their the enthusiasm is there, they've thought about it, but it takes some legwork and some people on the ground in order to build up that capacity so that you can do that. You know, Cameco, uh, I've been to Sakar Lake, uh, you know, the, our source of uranium in Northern Saskatchewan, 50% of the workers there are from neighboring First Nations. And, and Cameco has done an amazing job at, at things like catering companies, security companies, uh, even if I remember correctly, uh, the you know aircraft supply companies, I think where we took off from, I mean, all indigenous owned, led and operated. I mean, you know, th there are remarkable things happening in this country. There really are. And that is the way forward. And that was a, that was a huge, you know, that's why we're disappointed in, in KXL because they had really done the groundwork on this. I mean, the, the participation was real. Uh, we had a strong case for making that one. Anyway, it is the path forward and I won't be, I won't be uh, you know, dissuaded of that. It is the path forward for, for energy products in our provinces. Just as an aside, uh, when I led a congressional delegation uh, up to Fort McMurray, I wanted them to meet Jim, Chief Jim Boucher. Uh, one, of the, uh, one of the participants was a Congressman Rick Boucher. Both of them spelled their names. B-O-U-C-H-E-R. And as I introduced the congressman to the chief, I said, Chief Boucher, this is Congressman Boucher. Congressman Boucher, this is Chief Boucher. 
one of you is not pronouncing your name correctly, but I'll let the two of you settle it between yourselves. Uh, let's go on to another subject here, uh, clean tech or clean technology. This is, this is something that has a really, really broad definition, but I think most broadly, we would say that it's technologies that aim to improve environmental uh, sustainability. And I would, my observation is that clean technology means different things in different regions of Canada. Uh, in Alberta and Saskatchewan, it, it appears to me that the real strength in the global leadership positions uh, that uh, are in clean tech are in three areas, uh, industrial decarbonization, water treatment, and environmental remediation. So um, I'm going to start with uh, Minister Eyre. How does your government see this as an opportunity uh, where we can do things together and capitalize on this very strong and what appears to me a very profitable export sector? Well, I guess I'll, I'll focus on the decarbonization side of things and, and CCS just because it's it's a you know a pretty big high profile thing you know here in the province. I mean, um, I you know we're biased of course on CCS. We have the um, the world's first fully integrated post combustion uh, CO two uh, capture and storage project, and then the first commercial scale uh, CO two EOR project in the Weyburn uh, Mydale uh, oil field, the world's largest. I, I think. The challenge, frankly, with um, CCS around enhanced oil recovery is the skepticism out there about capture helping to get more oil out of the ground. And that is one thing I was talking to, uh, to EPAC members yesterday and, and I, you know, I, I raised this because um, I wrote a letter to the editor last year about, you know, Weyburn Mydale and how amazing it is. It's the environment, but it's also sustainability. And, and it was a pretty negative response. Now, again, that's anecdotal, but, but the, the issue you, you face with that, and we face in Saskatchewan, is that when you raise CCS around EOR, you know, certainly the environmental side does not particularly um, flock to that. And I, I think, and, and I know there's skepticism around that. Um, you know, and I've heard it even, you know, by uh, uh, in comments uh, from uh, Minister O'Regan's colleague, Minister Wilkinson, just about that EOR side of things. I hope that changes because it, it is a real opportunity, you know, to dovetail off what we do well, complement what we do well and build on that. Um, so certainly that would be, you know, my take on the carbonization side of things uh, uh, in terms of CCS around enhanced oil. I think that generally speaking, and, and um, you know, we've chatted about this before, a number of us, the 45Q um, tax credit in the US around CCUS has been extremely successful. I've been a proponent for a long time about the federal government doing something similar um, because it's booming down there. And I think we could do, as I say, something up here that, that could emulate that and get that really you know, rolling. The only thing is that you know, CCS has to also include um, you know, EOR. It can't be, you know, that every other part of CCUS is cool and the EOR part is not. So that, that would just be my take on that. <clears throat> uh, Minister Savage. Sure. Well, I guess to, to start with, we've, uh, our tier program, the uh, heavy, heavy industrial emitters program, uh, revenues of, of $750 million a year going into uh, clean tech, going back to the industry to develop innovation and and clean technology. So I think that's a, an important starting point. And of, of course we know for ESG, environmental social governance, you don't, uh, you, you have to establish both for our industry and for governments that we are taking it seriously and doing everything we, we, we can possible to, uh, to uh, lower environmental footprint and to uh, lower emissions, which uh, I would just add on to um, what Minister Bronwyn has said about carbon capture. Um, and uh, the only way that we can look at getting the, the oil sands to, to net zero is through carbon capture, utilization and storage. And uh, it's, it's, it's going to be a, a big task and we have to find ways to get there because sitting in the oil sands is the third largest reserves of oil on the planet, on the planet, right there in the oil sands. They, uh, they have been lowering emissions, they have been using technology, they have been competitive, and the world is gonna to continue to need additional oil. It's, it's, we're not getting off of oil, we just need to take emissions down from oil. And for the, for the oil sands, we, we can do that. We can do that, we can be competitive, we can uh, ensure that that production 
can uh, can be maintained and grown in a in a low carbon world. But we're going to need carbon capture to get there. And I know our industry is looking big, it is looking big and dreaming big on what to do, and uh, working both with uh, the federal government and the provincial government on ways to get there. And I think we can do it. I think that's an area where I can see uh, Minister O'Regan nodding there because we we speak weekly, probably weekly on this and other things on how do we get there? How do we how do we be, how can we continue to, to keep a viable and, and uh, productive oil and gas industry and grow it and be prosperous and create the jobs and at the same time lower emissions? And we can, we can do it. We just have to work together and we have to dream big and we have to look at things like a 45Q and, and be able to do it. So um, clean technology, just to get back to your question, I, I, I think there, there is, uh, we, we have to continue and we have to double down on it and we have to work together, Saskatchewan, Alberta, and the feds, we have to work together. Uh, I like the sound of that. Let me make this observation. I mean, uh, Minister Ayer, you talked about the Way Weyburn Mydale project. That was one of the things that we would always bring congressional delegations to come and see. At the time, it was about a billion dollar investment, which is pretty significant for a province the size of Saskatchewan, and it is actually reducing CO2 in the atmosphere. The TIER project referred to by Minister Savage, uh, $750 million a year. Both of those strike me as being maybe not carbon taxes, but clearly putting a price on carbon that actually reduces the amount of CO2 in the atmosphere uh, by deploying technology that can make a difference. And I would also make the observation that of the $2 billion put into clean technologies, uh, about $1.6 billion has come from the oil and gas business. So I think uh, industry is really leading uh, in terms of this, maybe sometimes even ahead of public policy. Uh, the question that I have for you, Minister O'Regan, is this, I mean, is this, is this a strong enough case uh, for us to be able to uh, go to uh, capital markets and say that we can develop uh, cleaner energy. Energy is good, but it's emissions that are bad. And so both the private sector and governments are committed to dealing with the issue of emissions. Is that, uh, can we make a strong enough case for that? Yeah, we can make a very strong case. Yeah, no, we can make a very strong case. I think that uh, <coughs> um, uh, Minister Aaron Savage, you hit on, on two key things, um, both of which I talked to uh, the Minister of Finance about. It's helpful to have an Albertan as Minister of Finance. She is very keen on carbon, uh, carbon capture and she is very keen on 45Q. Um, you know, and, and basically, and I don't know whether it'll be 45Q per se. So this is, based, this is the tax incentive that exists in the United States that's attracting a lot of clean tech and, and companies that, that uh, like carbon engineering that pre-pandemic, uh, Sonia and I were talking about going to visit together. And we will get there. We hopefully this year. Um, but but you know these are these are some amazing companies that carbon engineering is is capturing carbon literally out of the air. And uh, so when you talk about the export potential, the export potential is definitely there. The problem is that some of their customers want to bring them you know down south or or you know across the pond, as we would say, either to the European Union or to the United States. We don't want to lose these companies. We don't want to lose their IP. We want them based out of Canada. We got to make sure that we've got the right tax incentives uh, like a 45Q, a, you know, a Canada made 45Q that would exist here and, and would, would attract and retain the best and the brightest in clean tech. Um, I mean, we're, we're committed to that. We committed in the federal economic statement to becoming the most competitive um, uh, most competitive place in the world for, for clean tech to, to grow and to prosper. So, you know, how, how, we, how we find that mix uh, is going to be a big, it's going to be a challenge for the Minister of Finance and Deputy Prime Minister, but she's up for it. I mean, she's, uh, I was talking with her about this just last week. Um, as Sonia mentioned, we, you know, we, we actually spoke with some of the majors uh, in the oil sands early last week, I think last Monday. They are serious about zero emissions. They are serious about being competitive. This is something that, you know, I saw last year initially, um, you know, when we could see investment moving. But now uh, with this administration in, and I think with, a, you know, as, as we deal with the pandemic and we're seeing a lot of the trends we saw before the pandemic accelerate, um, we know what we got to do. They know what they got to do. They know where the money's going. They're smart. And uh, we are in a very, very competitive place, not just because we have the resources, but because we've got the people. 
And, uh, you know, that's what, you know, you, on the decision on KXL last week, and, you know, we heard very early on that the president was going to do it on inauguration day. And I called Sonia and I called Bronwyn and, and, uh, and you know. At 6.30 was, in the morning. <laughs> I know, I know, because I'm on new. I'm in Newfoundland, and I'm like, I've been up dealing with this, and I'm like, when do you wake them? It's a big deal, um, you know. At, at the same time, at the same time as a former morning show host, I can tell you, sleep in the mornings is extremely important, and it is not something I would deprive anybody of. But, but yeah, we had, you know, we had to get our heads around that. And the first, you're the first thing you think of are the people. Um, you know, we got to, we can't. I'm used to this in Newfoundland and I don't like being used to it. We're going to change it. I, I'm used to losing people. We're, mm. we're used to losing people in Newfoundland. Uh, the good news is, you know, uh, the way this, this wonderful country works is a lot of them uh, stay here, but they commute to your two provinces every week. That plane is full uh, with men and women who are back and forth and, and building our oil industry in this country. Um, you know, uh, so that they stay here. We, we want, you know, we've got a, a, we've got a great offshore industry here that went through its uh, challenges over the pandemic as well. Uh, these two know that because we would swap stories. I mean, uh, you know, especially uh, when I think about, you know, 10 months ago when we didn't know what was happening with the price of oil or what happened with, with our industries. But we are lining up to be very competitive. I think Brahman brings up some big challenges uh, earlier on, on investments in CCUS, on investments in SMRs. She's absolutely right about that. And we have to have uh, you know, our eyes wide open to those costs, but we're committed to doing it. Uh, we're committed to doing it together. It's just, uh, it's too important to the country. It's too important to our provinces. We are the three right here collectively, the three oil producing provinces in Canada. Um, it, is, it is our biggest industry. It is our number one export. Um, our, our biggest customer, particularly for your two provinces, uh, is now you know, the most aggressive administration we've ever seen in history on climate change. That's going to change a lot. Uh, we understand that the president's going to come out with even more tomorrow, uh, more sweeping measures uh, on climate. It, that will have an effect on our economy and our investments. We can meet the mark. We have survived the past four years with an administration that was not aligned with our governments and, and the direction that our governments was, was going in, that was slashing regulations and putting our companies in a position where they weren't as competitive. They've, they've gone through that. And I think now, you know, while the Americans catch up to where we are, we're, we're in a better position. And I, I won't lose pole position. Well, you know, there, there's lots of questions that, uh, that we could talk about, but I'm actually going to switch to the subject that you just touched upon, Minister O'Regan, that's the U.S. government uh, and its plans moving forward. Uh, the Biden administration's come in. It's pretty clear right out of the gate that energy and environment issues are uh, top of mind for, those, uh, for them. Um, and... Let's talk maybe a bit about the kind of strategy that Canada and the United States need to engage in as, as uh, parties go back. Uh, you know, uh, Prime President Biden has said he's you know, back in the Paris Accord. Uh, COP26 is coming up in Edinburgh, November of this year. Uh, you know, this whole issue of climate, competitiveness, energy are in, in, inextricably linked. And so uh, when we have discussions with the United States, are, are, are we going to be talking about those three, three things together or is we going to be, are we going to be talking about them as, uh, as one-off pieces? I'll take it. Uh, I, think, I think everything's going to be integrated. I think the way, you know, the way that um, uh, I mean, we're still sizing up this administration. Um, my, my colleague, uh, we expect to be sworn in in a few days. Jennifer Granholm. Um, she brings a lot to the table. She's a uh, halfway through her autobiography. I want to have it read by the time she's sworn in. I'm, I'm talking with her. Um, <laughs> you know, she was she was governor of Michigan through the through the recession and uh, of of the late knots. And uh, uh, you know, we all remember how how uh, the automotive industry took a, such a massive hit back then in 2008 2009. Um, so she knows crisis. Uh, she knows change. Um, she knows our country. Um, she, as, a, as a governor of a border state. Uh, she's also half Newfoundlander, so that bodes well, I think, anyway. Um, means she's got a lot of common sense and she's a very practical person. Uh, I'm looking forward to getting to know her. Um, the, you know, the administration is taking it very seriously. I, I, I will say this, um, you know, the president right now is, doing, is, is going through uh, things that he can do by executive order. We all know, and Gary, you know, um, 
that the business of getting climate and, and economy and prosperity and inclusivity, making sure that everybody is included in all this, getting that done right is tough. It is tough politics. We saw it you know, on KXL, we're seeing it on a lot of fronts. Um, they are gonna have to deal with, uh, they're gonna have to deal with Native Americans. They are gonna have to deal with uh, communities. They're gonna have to deal with Congress. They're gonna have to deal with states. Um, there's going to be you know, a lot of to and fro as they get into the weeds in this. We know that because we've been doing that for a long time. Um, but but you know, I think the, the biggest, <laughs> greatest thing right now the Biden administration is predictability. Um, all our people want that, our companies want that, our investors want that, predictability and security. The sooner that we can sit down at the table and talk about what Premier Kenny was, you know, was talking about, a, 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 a broader agreement on energy supply and climate action, securing those markets, and making sure that as they talk about, you know, the, and we heard the Deputy Prime Minister speaking yesterday about the Buy American, and this is something that the President and the Prime Minister spoke about, and making sure that, you know, Canada is involved here. Uh, we, we have to make sure that when they talk about domestic and they look particularly at energy, uh, that, you know, there's a clear understanding of how integrated our markets are. Um, so, you know, we gotta, we're not going to presume anything. We got to go in there with a very strong case. Um, I think that, uh, one, one of the, one of the things that I can tell you the three of us have learned, um, as well as my colleagues from across the country is the more that we work together, the better, uh, you know, I'm not gonna, we disagree. Don't get me wrong. We, we speak to each other. We, we disagree, but we agree on a lot. And, um, and, and look, when you're sitting down against the Americans, they're tough customers at the table. Um, you know, the less light that's between us, the better. Uh, James Rashad and I actually last month um, presented together on, on Canadian and American energy security at a function, a virtual function that the uh, Canadian embassy held in the United States in front of a lot of people who are either going to be, who are, who could be in now or, could have been in the Biden administration, a lot of influential congressmen and people in Washington, we presented together very deliberately uh, <laughs> to let them know that we were on the right track and we were working together on CCUS and a number of other fronts. And that went over well. Uh, so, you know, we plan on, on following that same path uh, because we have a lot of challenges ahead of us and uh, it's, just, it's just too important for us to get it right. So, uh, Minister O'Regan, having referenced uh, both Premier Kenny and uh, his representative, James Rajat. Uh, I, I'm going to now oppose this to Sonia Savage. Uh, I mean, do we come in as Team Canada or are we going to be uh, expressing ourselves as different jurisdictions with different interests and different approaches? I think we have to all be uh, singing from the same songbook. And uh, look, I've been been dealing uh, since, since the spring, I've been uh, talking with uh, American oil producing states on an inter integrated energy market when we had the price collapse and we started seeing storage fill up, uh, we, we were very, very concerned about the future of energy and where, uh, where the markets were going for, for oil and gas. So we, I probably spoke to every single uh, jurisdiction, oil and gas producing jurisdiction in the United States on the importance of an integrated uh, North American energy market. And basically they need our oil as much as we need access to their market, particularly the heavy blend. Um, oil sands blend. It goes to uh, pad two and pad three, the refineries in, in those areas are configured to take, to take oil. And the other places, the other sources to get the heavy production that those refineries need is Venezuela or Mexico. And the decline, uh, the production is declining in Mexico and Venezuela is uh, anything but a re reliable place to source oil from. So we've been having these conversations since the spring and just in the, the past week since the, uh, the KXL dis decision, I've been circling back uh, and spoke with the chair of the Texas Railroad Commission, the energy secretary in Oklahoma and others about, about the, the importance of these markets. And I know Seamus and I have had several conversations of, of ensuring that, uh, that it's, it's clearly under, understood that it's a continental market. I guess the one thing that you still have to, to make clear, and I can see Seamus is going to smile because he knows this is my, my, I can't, you know, my repetitive line is the Constitution. Absolutely. Under the Constitution section 92A, the provinces are the exclusive owners of the natural resources. We have the exclusive right to develop, produce, the natural resources. So Canada can't move ahead 
with these conversations with without Alberta, without Saskatchewan, without the jurisdiction, without the, the owners of the resources. But uh, likewise, we want to work closely with the Canadian government to make sure that that uh, any of those discussions that talk about climate and, and energy ensures that uh, our industry can be competitive, ensures that it reflects the diverse and regional interests of the provinces, respects the constitution and, uh, and, and moves forward in a way that, uh, that helps our entire country. I was schooled on this day two on the job here. Love the Constitution. Absolutely. In a, in a firm but friendly manner. <laughs> Minister Braun Winner. Well, I guess in terms of Team Canada, absolutely, um, you know, agree with what's been said. I think important that, you know, our, those provincial voices um, not be subsumed. Um, you know, and, and I, I think that, that we all know that it's important that we, you know, get our own sort of stories across as we approach what's coming. We can read the writing on the wall, of course, in terms of, of President Biden. I, I think um, in terms of climate, uh, just being absolutely realistic, Prime Minister Trudeau has credibility. Um, and so we have to count on, on that, certainly. I, I do think that there's great promise there in terms of the ideological akinness of the two uh, administrations. And so probably if, if they're going to listen to anyone for all the historical reasons out there of friendship and peace and everything else, I think on the ideological side, the, the you know, Prime Minister Trudeau and Minister O'Regan and others will, will have a voice certainly. And that's, that's um, positive. I think in terms of predictability, I'm nervous about the non-predictability. I think the keystone, the way that was, um, done indicated a, a speed maybe we weren't completely reckoning uh, on and was unfortunate maybe that there wasn't a little bit more of a, of a buffer but politically you know he did what he what he did and and we're all we're politicians we we know the deal on that I, I think there is concern out there about as I say on the predictability side um, and bridge line five for example certainly there's skittishness about uh, <clears throat> revocation because of what we saw last week We'll see where that goes. I think I, I would just say that as the three of us, you know, as, as the federal entity and as provinces, I think, you know, there was a lot of talk going into this uh, administration about, you know, even on Keystone, and it's been alluded to a few times, you know, could we have gotten hydrogen on there? Would it have been seen differently if we, you know, so all this kind of high level geopolitical stuff uh, around climate and selling that side of things. I just think we all have to be aware as politicians and be uh, and as governments about the perception of let them eat cake. And I mean that, it, 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 I, I say that because, you know, thousands lost their jobs mm. with Keystone and that decision last week, right? In, in the Estevan area here in Saskatchewan, the transition from coal has led to really significant economic upheaval for people, for families. We have to remember that. Um, and, and when I knocked doors during the recent campaign here in Saskatchewan, you know, there were a lot of households that had gone from single income, uh, from double income to single income. People were really struggling and, and the price of the pump and the price of heating your home, these are actual things to people. I think we just have to be very mindful of, of being too theoretical. And that goes obviously for Biden, but that's, you know, his voters need to, to, you know, he needs to worry about his own. But I think from, from, from Canada's perspective and even from the provinces, I think we have to always remain really moored in the real, the cost of transition to people yeah. and the real struggle out there in the impact of some of these decisions. And if we remember them, I think we'll find our way. We'll find our way together, but, but it is, it, it is a reality. And I think we just, have to be so, and, and the same goes for, for oil companies. As I say, when I spoke to EPAC yesterday, I was saying, you know, you guys kind of want me to, you know, sell your story about CCS and hydrogen and everything else, but just keep in mind from my perspective, those things do have cost impacts to people too. And so it's not just government, it's also the, the oil sector and, and what we do on their behalf and, uh, and how focused we all have to remain on, on, on real people, ordinary people who have real jobs and are really struggling. So I, again, that's a slightly convoluted way of answering, but I think those are important. And I've thought about that a lot after this Keystone decision. 
I'd like to just Mr. build here for a second on what Bronwyn said. I got, uh, as sometimes happens late nights in the legislature, got animated on, on this issue. Um, and, and, um, and, and, you know, there were, there were parties uh, in, in our parliament who celebrated the, the, the death of KXL and yet, you know, say that they're in the corner of workers. You know, I was shocked by that. I was shocked by that behavior, to be honest with you. I mean, you know, there were thousands of people who were counting on this project. Uh, so you never lose sight of that. I mean, we, uh, I'm on, I just, it was just announced today, I'm on the International Energy Agency's Global Commission on People-Centered Clean Energy Transitions. Because I don't stop talking about this. Uh, we, if we do not have a critical mass of people with us, as we lower emissions, uh, we're not going to get anywhere, right? Um, so that, that I speak that to that who, who's for, I speak that to people whose top priority is lowering emissions. But you know, I also say to people like you got you know you you have to make a living, people, and and you do what you do so well. We can't afford to lose you, so we got to make sure we keep you in place. That was a big thing for me, is you know, because it was getting very troublesome out here in in Newfoundland as the price of oil continued to drop as it did in, in, for all of our provinces. Making sure that people are a part of this is, is absolutely essential. I don't even like saying the word transition because people have enough change going on right now with COVID, with, with energy, with our economy. They don't wanna hear about transition and they particularly don't wanna hear about it with people smiling. Like they got enough going on, you know? It's, this is about lowering emissions. That is what it's about. And, and it should be industrial agnost industrially agnostic it's about lowering emissions. Well, and just to, to jump in there, we had, uh, you know, immediately after KXL permit was rescinded, we, we had over a thousand people got their layoff notices from mm. KXL. That's real. Yeah. That's real. Those people who had jobs, whose families relied upon that, now don't have jobs. Mm. And that is extremely, extremely heartbreaking because it's a tough economy out there right now. And these are jobs that are here, here right now. And that's the one thing we, we can't ever lose sight of is jobs that are here and now people who are trained to work, who want to work. Sure. Um, I know there'll be, there'll be jobs in the future as we transition to a uh, lower, lower carbon, but we need jobs now and yeah. we can't ever lose sight and we can't ever prioritize the jobs of the future for hardworking jobs right now because we'll lose sight of what's important to people and what matters. And right now, whereas there's no getting out of the, the pandemic, there's no economic recovery for Alberta or Canada or Saskatchewan for any of us without a strong oil and gas sector. And that means uh, that that means we have to, uh, to, treat, to treat the jobs that are here and now equally to jobs that are of the future. Agreed. Ministers, we are approximately uh, four minutes over time, which uh, Seamus O'Regan, <clears throat> as the host of Canada AM, would know you could never do. So <laughs> never do. No, I want to. <laughs> well, we wouldn't be on right now. It'd be a commercial break. They'd just stop, <laughs> They'd just stop it. O'Regan can keep talking. Uh, look, uh, I want to thank all of you, uh, and, and and I hope that you'd be interested in coming back because uh, I can tell our hundreds of uh, webinar participants. I had many, many questions that uh, they sent in, sure. uh, you know, on the chat function and, you know, on LinkedIn and others, and we just were not able to get to them. And I, I tried my best to stick to the, the higher level ones that we were able to consolidate from people who sent in their questions last week. And so I apologize to those if we, if we didn't get to your questions, but we tried our very, very best. Um, just, uh, you know, maybe uh, if you would be in agreement, we'd come back and on another occasion, because there are issues like uh, Minister Savage talked about, you know, the integration of, uh, of our energy and how much of our oil goes into pad two and pad uh, three. Uh, this is the U.S. Midwest. We've got refineries in Whiting, uh, just outside of Chicago, the Marathon refinery uh, that I've been to in Detroit, um, the, the uh, Synovus facility in, uh, in Lima, Ohio. Uh, they rely on us and, you know, maybe in a future topic might be what we're going to do with, um, you know, the governor of Michigan who wants to end line five, uh, which provides the oil that goes into Michigan and what the cost of gasoline would be to people in Michiganians if they had to truck it, their gasoline in from uh, refineries in the Gulf Coast instead of producing it uh, in the state. 
and also what it means to the provinces of Ontario and, and Quebec, which right. will lie on fly uh, through line five that goes from Michigan back up into Sarnia. That's right. Uh, <coughs> these are big issues that we have to deal with. I, I, I'll only close with this note that, you know, uh, the, the governor of Montana has uh, indicated that uh, he wants KXL to go forward. Labor unions have made that strong case in the United States. Uh, the Wall Street Journal, uh, you know, sent out uh, an editorial on uh, the 20th of January saying uh, that uh, the killing of the Keystone uh, pipeline, uh, I mean, this is not me saying this, this is the Wall Street Journal's editorial board. On his first day, he insults Canada and ends thousands of jobs on both sides of the border. So uh, I hope you'll be interested in coming back again. Uh, and I hope that our viewers would have the understanding based on the interaction that you've seen with these ministers, how frequently they talk to each other, the kinds of things that they have in common, the things that they want to work on together that, uh, you know, uh, these ministers are all working hard on behalf of Canadian interests, not the interests of Alberta or Saskatchewan or Newfoundland and Labrador, but of all Canadians. And I, I thank them for their uh, great work in this area. And uh, I thank all of our participants uh, for, uh, for signing on uh, to this webinar uh, for the Canada West Foundation. And uh, uh, we hope, of course, that those who watch that found this of value uh, to contribute generously uh, to the Canada West Foundation, a not-for-profit. Uh, we can issue you a tax receipt, uh, go to our website at uh, canadawestfoundation.ca. So ministers, thank you for taking this time out of your busy days, your early morning or mid-morning or afternoon, wherever you are in Canada watching, uh, we bid you adieu. Thank you. Thanks, Gary. Thank you. Thank you so much, Gary. Thank, thank you. you. Great to see you. Great to see you too.